Uh, I'll also tell you one thing that uh, when I wrote my first book, Deadly Departure, I did an interview with the chairman of the safety board at the time, whose name was Jim Hall. He was a southerner from South Carolina, uh, from uh, uh, Tennessee. And I walked in his office, this was many years ago, I walked in his office and he said, Christine, have a seat. I just want you to know the only thing standing between me and a Jack Daniels is this interview. Oh, <laughs> so I'm now feeling like the only thing standing between you and picking up your school, your kids from school, is this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like 20 minutes long. I'll let you ask questions after that. Then you're on your own if they go too long. Um, who here has seen the movie Sully? Okay, so not many of you. So I won't, I won't be a spoiler alert. You know what happens. Yes, we all know what happens, and that is in fact the point of the movie Sully, which I'll get to in a minute. But there was a big controversy in my world, in the world of aviation um, reporters and journalists and safety people. And that was that in the movie, the, after the plane lands on the water, the investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board do a bit of a grilling on Sullenberger and Jeff Skiles, his first officer. And they're, you know, they're perceived, the investigators are perceived as very um, belligerent and confrontational and narrow-minded. And poor Sullenberger is seen as the great victim of, you know, these mean bureaucrats. So that was, in fact, not the way the, um, that it actually played out. And uh, I went to see it the, the night before it opened, so I noted this. And when I got home, I called Bob Benson, who was the investigator in charge in the movie. He's not identified, but he was. And uh, I called him up, and I said, so, Bob, have you seen the movie? And he was so angry. I mean, livid. And I said, okay, well, maybe I can do a story sort of pointing out the inconsistencies between the record and what was depicted in the movie. So I did, and the story appeared in the New York Times. And then, of course, I was feeling very smug. So I called him up again. I said, well, so now your story's been told in the New York Times. Do you feel any better? And he said, no. My sister just went to see the movie. And afterwards, she called me up, and she said, Bob, how could you have done that to Sully? <laughs> So that was the story of, of uh, Bob Benson, and I felt badly for him. Um, but I did understand, to be honest, I did understand why he was, or why that confrontation became a big part of the movie, even though it wasn't really the untold story, it was the fictionalized story of the miracle on the Hudson. Because um, the Clint Eastwood, the producer of the movie, and I had basically the same dilemma. We were both writing about events that the world thought they knew. He was writing about the Miracle on the Hudson flight, U.S. Airways flight 1549, and I was writing about Malaysia 370, which was the airplane that disappeared. Mm -hmm. So uh, those, those two accidents are connected in another way, and that is that when it comes to the role of the human, U.S. Airways and Malaysia 370 are the yin and the yang of air accidents. They're flip sides of the same coin. So I wrote Malaysia 370 after covering the story for ABC News. And uh, on March 8th, 2014, I was on vacation in Vietnam when I got a call from my producer and she said, how quickly can you get to Kuala Lumpur? So I went there and uh, my job for ABC is twofold or threefold or as many folds as they want to give me. But you know, sometimes you see me on TV, but that's not my main, I'm not their talking head normally. They use some other people. What they want me to do is refer to the Rolodex of air disasters that I keep in my head. And in that respect, I can advise them on how an investigation is handled and what, what questions you can ask when you have the opportunity to talk to you know, the, the spokespeople and what are the things you should be looking for. And what of what you're being told is believable and what is of what you're being told is even knowable, which is not as easy as it sounds. So when I uh, had been in Malaysia for about a week, we got that startling news, because you may remember that they were looking for Malaysia 370 in the South China Sea, that is along the flight path from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing. But when, uh, when this news came that the airplane had been in fact flying for seven hours, yeah. we knew it couldn't be there. And so uh, the reason they knew that the plane had been flying for seven hours is because the airplane communicates with a satellite it gives a little ping. It says, I have power, I have power, I have power. And it gives that ping about every hour. And it did that for seven hours. And if the plane had power, that means it was flying. And if it had power for seven hours, that means, because we know how much fuel was put on the airplane, that means that the plane was flying probably until it ran out of fuel. 
So that was a big, big change. And when I learned of that change, I started to think, believe it or not, I think I know what happened to this airplane. So why do I think that? I'm going to tell you. But before I tell you why I thought I had solved the mystery of, of Malaysia 370, I want to tell you a little bit about hypoxia. Because I thought Malaysia 370 was a zombie flight, a case of pilot incapacitation by hypoxia. So, hypoxia. So, um, we know that when we get on an airplane and before it takes, or as it takes off, it pressurizes the air like blowing up a balloon, and the density of the air inside the cabin is like it is here on the ground, or actually, to be literal, it's at 6,000 feet, so like Denver. The density of the air in the passenger cabin is like Denver. And the reason that needs to happen is not because there's more oxygen in the air. The oxygen in the air is 21%, here, there. But we need the pressure, we need the density of the air to actually help push the air into our lungs so that we can breathe and so that our brains and every other organ is refreshed by the oxygen inside. So if that doesn't happen, so they're not on a plane, they pressurize it, but if it doesn't happen, we will get oxygen starved because the, uh, we don't get enough oxygen breathing in at altitude if we've lost pressurization. And if we don't get enough oxygen, we begin to feel blissful and happy, what I call a, a lovely sense of bliss or a sense of comforting idiocy. <laughs> no political jokes about comforting idiots right now. Um, so there are two kinds of hypoxia. There's rapid and there's insidious. Insidious comes on gradually. It's like the story you tell your kids about how do you boil a frog? Well, you put them in a pot of water and you turn up the heat, and by the time the frog realizes what's going on, it's too late. So that's insidious. The plane will take off, it never pressurizes, and slowly, 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 we become starved of oxygen. But we never, re we never feel the alarming sense that we would in the case of a rapid case of hypoxia. In a rapid case, we are at 35,000 feet, boom, something opens up in the cabin, the air rushes out. We know instantly, because that air isn't just rushing out of the cabin, it's rushing out of us, out of every orifice. And there are some discomforting effects to that. <laughs> We'll leave it at that. <laughs> so, um, so in the scenario on the flight deck of Malaysia 370, I believe the pilot suffered both, insidious and rapid. So now I'm going to tell you my theory about what happened on Malaysia 370. The plane was at an altitude of 35,000 feet, and the period of high workload was over. This would not have been an unusual time for the captain to say, I'm going to the bathroom. He's a 53-year-old man. He's a smoker. He's probably had a cup of coffee before his overnight flight and he's been in his seat for two hours. So I think he said to the first officer, your airplane, and left to go to the bathroom. Whatever, he was not in the cockpit at the time, and there was a sudden, fast decompression of the airplane. Now this is, as I described, a very <coughs> startling and dramatic event. The first officer would have known he had a problem. And his, uh, not only does he have this physical discomfort, but he would recognize he had to do something. His limbs would be trembling, because that's a sign of rapid onset of hypoxia, spasmodic movement of the extremities. He would have tried to reach over to the transponder and notify everyone in the air around him that he had an emergency, which he can do by changing the transponder frequency to 7700. This is where I think he accidentally turned the wrong knob disconnecting the transponder, putting it into a standby position, which is effectively off. And at that point, no one in the air or on the ground would know anymore that that blip in the sky <coughs> was Malaysia 370. It's just another anonymous green dot on the radar screen. I think at this point, he knew he had to get his mask on, and so he did. The emergency mask is stowed to the right-hand side. He put it on, and here's where I think the second failure occurred. I don't believe he was getting 100% oxygen under pressure, which at 35,000 feet is required to rejuvenate him. It's not like just breathing in air. That air has to push in to his lungs. And if that didn't happen, he would be getting enough oxygen to remain conscious, but not enough oxygen yeah. to remain sensible. That's where this insidious mm -hmm. hypoxia comes on. He did not know that he was adult, and he thought he was doing the right thing. 
So he turns the plane back towards Kuala Lumpur. He's got a problem. And now he's thinking, I'm going to bring the airplane back. I'm going to save the day. He's 27 years old. We know he's a bit of a player. He's thinking he's a hero. I'm going to land that plane, and I am going to be the Malaysian Sullenberger. But that's not what happened. He turns back towards Kuala Lumpur, and then he goes off track. And then he starts heading north, and then he starts heading west. And then that plane turns and heads south. And at that point, this is where I believe he lost all consciousness. And the plane from that point on just flew on its last heading until running out of fuel. So that's the story, and you've read the book, so you know I've told you that story. But the question you have to say is, Christine, where did that come from? Why did you think this happened on Malaysia 370? What makes you think you're so smart? Well, I told you about that Rolodex of air crashes that I keep in my head. <coughs> and two accidents that I knew about, even at, while I was working for ABC, came to mind. The first one was called Helios Fly Flight 522. This was a 737 that took off from Cyprus heading to Athens. And rather than having a sudden depressurization of the airplane, it would appear that the pilots never pressurized the airplane when they took mm -hmm. off. Sometimes they do that for reasons that are aeronautical in nature. But in any event, I don't think they, they pressurized the aircraft, and the plane took off. As it passed through 12,000 feet, they got an alarm in the cockpit saying, you don't have pressurization. And in the back, where the passengers were, the oxygen masks fell. Mm -hmm. So what did the pilots do? They didn't put on their masks. They decided, probably because they were already feeling the effects of oxygen starvation, they decided to diagnose the problem. So the captain gets up out of his seat, and he goes to the control panel right behind him, and he collapses. He's unconscious. The first officer collapses over the control yoke, and the plane continues on its pre-programmed route. So it flies, and it flies, and it's heading over its in, in Greek airspace, and everyone in the back I'm sorry to tell you, is unconscious and probably dead because their oxygen gives them 12 minutes. Their oxygen mask gives them 12 minutes of consciousness. This plane was flying for two hours. So everyone is dead on the plane except for one person. There's a flight attendant who just happens to be a student pilot. And he is using the flight attendant emergency oxygen bottles, which each have 30 minutes worth of oxygen in them. And he goes through all four of them. Now he knows he's got a problem probably still has some oxygen, or he wouldn't have made his way up to the front. But he goes up to the cockpit, and he pushes in the cockpit door. And what does he see? The first officer collapsed over the, over the yoke. The captain, dead, behind his seat. He sits down in the captain's seat, and he puts the oxygen mask on. He's a clever one, this one. He knows, he knew he had a problem, and he'd been solving it all along. Why he didn't get into the cockpit sooner, I don't know. But in any event, Alongside of the cockpit on either side are two Greek fighter jets. And they're thinking, or they were thinking when they were dispatched to this airplane that's been <coughs> flying without any kind of radio contact, that they're looking at another 9-11 event in Athens. That's what they're thinking. But they see that there's frost on the windshield. Now they know there's a depressurization event, and it's so cold up there that uh, that's what caused the frost. Then they see this guy walk in. They see him put the mask on. And one of the Greek fighter pilots points, follow me. And this pilot says, mayday, mayday, into what he thinks is the radio microphone. It was not, but it's recorded on the cockpit voice recorder. But he doesn't have any time, because seven minutes after entering the cockpit, the last of the fuel runs through the engines. And that plane plows into a mountain. Ugh. And the last person on that flight is killed. Mm -hmm. So that was not the first accident like that. Though it did end badly, there was one in 1996, which was an American Transair. This plane took off from Indianapolis and was at 33,000 feet when it had a sudden decompression of the aircraft. In this case, however, the first officer did right away put on his mask. The captain did not, and the flight engineer did not, nor did the flight attendant who was in the, cabin at, in the cockpit at the time. So they all passed out. But he remained conscious. Now, there was a lot of details which are in my book about what happened after that. But the point is this. The first officer remained conscious and got the airplane back on the ground. He was the last breath saving that airplane from a certain fate, like what had happened to Helios. So when I was covering the Malaysia 370 event and I heard about that odd change of flight path, that's when I said, that's what happened. So, why do we do air accident investigations anyway? I mean, they fill the news after there's an event. 
And a lot of people think it's for closure for the families. It's not the case. It's nice, but mm -hmm. that's not the reason. And I used to work for a law firm, and I know one of the women here uh, worked in a law firm. You know, a lot of people think it's so that people can sue and get a lot of money. And that does happen, and maybe that is your isn't so nice, you can argue that, but that's not why it happens either. Air accidents are investigated to give the, so that, excuse me, in nearly every governmental agency around the world, they subscribe to the philosophy that air accidents are investigated so that errors can be identified and prevented. And that's the reason. That's why air travel is so safe today, because we have a long-running practice globally of learning from calamity. So I'm not part of the official investigation, that's obvious. But I am part of a new phenomenon that you'll see happening not just in aviation, but in, in all sorts of fields, and that is I'm a geek or an academic or an armchair investigator. We're, our, our ranks are full of them, but we are basically amateurs, amateur investigators. And we are trying to hold the Malaysians and the Australians accountable in this case with what is a fresh eye approach. So two weeks ago, you may have seen on the news that uh, Malaysia's transport minister announced that they were ending the sea search for the wreckage of Malaysia 370. But the cyber citizens like me, every, you know, a lot of people are saying that's bad news, but the cyber citizens don't believe that. I don't believe that. I think that this may actually push attention to the alternative theories like mine and say, maybe we don't know this did happen, but if it could have happened, we can learn from that. So who here is watching The Crown? you got to see it. This is it. so good. <laughs> so the good. Crown. Okay, so if you are astute, you may have noticed in The Crown that there's an airplane in some of the background shots, and they talk about it a bit, called the Comet, the de Havilland Comet. So this was the, uh, the world's first jetliner, and it came about right around the time of the coronation of the Queen. And this airplane, on three separate occasions over the course of two years, exploded in the air, killing everyone on board. And for a long time, nobody knew what was happening, why these planes were coming apart in the air. And so what the uh, British aviation authorities did, along with the airplane manufacturers, they said, well, let's examine what could have happened, and let's fix that. Well, eventually, they did find out what the real cause was. But until that point, they didn't sit mm -hmm. around and just say, well, we don't know, we haven't found the wreckage, let's just you know, go, act, go back and fly the airplane again. They examined the what could have been. So what have we learned over the past century of commercial aviation from disasters? Sweeping generalization, warning, but I will say for the first 50 years or so, it was all about the machine. How do we make the machine better, like the Comet? How do we make it more robust, more long range, more protective of passengers in the case of a bad event, and more unlikely to have a bad event? In the second half of the century, and into this one, the focus isn't so much on the machine anymore. It's on the person flying the machine. How do the people in the cockpit interact with each other? How do they interact with the controls? Mm -hmm. And how do they react with, in, interact with the whole system that is aviation, ATC, and airline operations, and mechanics, and ground handlers? That's a whole system. Learning how to fix the human, however, has not been simple. And it hasn't been entirely upward. You'd think it would be, but it's not. In 1935, in Dayton, Ohio, Boeing was trying to compete for a long-range bomber. And so they brought their little, their big airplane out to Wright Field, where they were going to demonstrate it, along with a bunch of competitors, Lockheed and some, uh, Douglas. They all had airplanes. This one was called, by the way, the Flying Fortress. I know you have heard about it, because you even hear about them today. But in any event, they took off with the airplane, the, the test pilots, showing it off to the Army Air Corps. And the gust locks, which are little pins or, 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 or brackets that hold the control surfaces in place, they were still on. So when the plane took off, it was locked into an ascent position. They couldn't do anything. They'd lost control of the aircraft. So it went like this until it stalled and fell to the ground. Two of the five people on, the bo on board the airplane died. Everyone else sat around and said, what do we do? What do we do so that we don't forget the things that are essential to safe flight? And what did they come up with? We all use it today. The checklist. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't love the checklist? It's brilliant. But it's not perfect. And here's why. Pilots read the same checklist sometimes eight or ten times a day. And by the third or the fourth reading, they may not be paying as much attention. 
In other cases, when the pilot is very busy with an unexpected event, the checklist can distract the pilot from the important task of flying the airplane or navigating the airplane, and there have been instances of that. Aircraft, aircraft automation is another one of those improvements, like the human better, by automating the tasks that sometimes bore the pilots, complex equations or routine tasks. So automation was supposed to take that job from the pilot. But who can remember that event where the pilots were coming from California to Minneapolis and they overflew their destination, right? They were so confident that the airplane was going to do what they programmed it to do that they weren't even paying attention to the airplane anymore. Automation can sometimes make pilots complacent. On the other hand, sometimes it can be so complex that they don't know what the airplane is doing. So what they've discovered with automation is that airlines want the pilots to use it more because it does take, take away those mind-numbing tasks. But the more pilots use automation, studies have shown that the flabbier their flying mm -hmm. skills get. Just like I can't remember a phone number anymore. Why? I sublet that job to my phone. <coughs> and that's exactly what's happening with pilots. So I'm going to I'm going to at, let you ask some questions, but before I close, I want to tell you another way that uh, that the Hudson flight and Malaysia 316 are um, as as a, as opposed as they appear to be. Another way that they're similar. I believe they're a study of what we can learn about the essential role of humans, not just in aviation, but in life itself. The last section of my book in The Crash Detectives is called Resiliency. And in that section of the book, I interview about six or seven pilots, all of whom escaped disaster by the way they handled an unexpected event. There was Captain Richard de Cretney. I called him Captain Fantastic. He's a real looker. Anyway, he was, <laughs> <laughs> he was flying on, on Airbus A380. That's the world's largest airliner right now. And he took off from Singapore and lost, almost immediately lost, three engines and nearly all of the essential systems. But he and the other four pilots in the cockpit flew that airplane around until nine, for 90 minutes while they tried to assess and figure out how to fly that airplane, and they landed it with no injuries. And then there's Peter Burkle from British Airways, also not a bad looking guy. <laughs> he lost both engines on a British Airways uh, 777 38 seconds before touchdown at Heathrow. And if you've ever flown that approach, there's a tube stop and a gas station that he had to get over before he put that airplane on the runway. And darned if he didn't do it with some quick thinking, single quick thinking action, he saved the day. So. The Sully and Skiles and Decretney and Burkle and all of those pilots who are profiled, they saved the day for, for these factors. This is what I discovered when I, when I interviewed them. They had these things in, in common. They had training. They had experience. They had positivity. And they had, where is the other one? Their uniquely human ability to react to novel events. Mm -hmm. So U.S. Airways 1549 is not in my book. Sully blurbed my book, and he liked my book, and I'm happy with that. But I figured, look, we all know what happened to 1549. I didn't need to put that in my book. They had an airplane that couldn't fly, but there were humans who could safely land it. The flip side of that coin is Malaysia 370. They had a plane that was flying brilliantly, but it lacked the human ingenuity to put that airplane on the ground. That was a, a, an irreplaceable factor, that uniquely human ability. So when you write a book about air disasters, people think you are a disaster queen or a downer. But believe me when I tell you this, I think The Crash Detectives is an uplifting book because it shows how ingenuity and tenacity and imagination together created this amazing thing called the airplane. And in the past century, Humans have layered onto this invention so that now we get on an airplane and we travel around the world from one part of the earth to the other and we have a near perfect safety record. We have learned from the earlier mistakes and we are constantly making that original idea, that original Wright Brothers idea, even better. The airplane, I truly believe, brings the world together. And what a day to be talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, it teaches us, again, I don't want to get emotional, but it teaches us how wonderfully different we are. 
This is a wonderful, terrific ambiguity. Flying has always been, and remains to this day, human-centered, with awe-inspiring results. And that's the story of the crash detective.